Welcome back, my fellow watchers of the multiverse, to another brand new If I Had Written series, where I'll be bringing pre-writes, rewrites, and cancelled projects to life on this channel, and in today's series, we're going to be looking at If I Had Written the MCU's Avengers Secret Wars. But let's get in to If I Had Written the MCU's Avengers Secret Wars. Location, the hero's ship. Things had not changed much since the Avengers gathered together after Kang the Conqueror had scattered all of them. America Chavez, with the help of the Fantastic Four, had helped to gather all of them together, except Thor, who they had trouble finding. Doctor Strange still remembered how it was for him to walk away from the world that Kang placed him in, that world that he was in. Strange had everything, he was leaving his wildest dreams. Strange remembered the experience as it was yesterday. One moment, he was fighting Kang, they had gotten a trump card as he who remains appeared with Eliath. Loki also appeared and Strange was sure that the battle was over because they knew that they could now defeat Kang. That was when Kang changed the whole timeline and separated all of them. He who remains deployed America Chavez, and they got back every one of them, except Thor. They had also joined forces with the Fantastic Four, which he who remains explained to them that he had been working behind the scenes to stop Kang the Conqueror and the Council of Kangs. Currently, America Chavez and Loki had gone to retrieve Thor and Doctor Strange, hoped that they'd be successful. They all needed themselves together. If they wanted to defeat Kang, they must be united. It had been quite a while since they had seen He Who Remains, as Reed Richards told Strange that he was busy on a project. Shiri and Peter Parker shared Strange's fears. The more they delayed in attacking Kang the Conqueror, the stronger he would become. The person that feared this the most was Scott. Scott just wanted to go back home to Hope and his daughter. Unfortunately, the heroes had not been able to locate them. They were already frightened by the amount of army power he would have amassed by now. As time was not a factor for him, the Human Torch suddenly pulled Doctor Strange from his thoughts as he alerted him that Reed wanted to meet with him at the control room. Doctor Strange wondered what it could be for. Reed Richards liked having meetings at the control room because he said that it made him feel in control of things. All Doctor Strange could actually say about Reed was that he was an absolute genius. Lately, Peter, Shiri, Scott, and Reed had been spending quite a lot of time in the lab, planning and inventing new things. Doctor Strange knew that Peter Parker must have been having the time of his life. As Strange walked down the hallway with Johnny, he marveled at the sight of the vast empty space that they were in. Reed Richards had built the ship and he had found a pocket dimension, a dimension full of nothing, as their hideout. Reed Richards' design of the ship was so fascinating as he created multiple rooms for each of them, and it could be suited to their preference. Doctor Strange's room, for instance, resembled his New York Sanctum. Even though it made him homesick, it made him remember not to get too comfortable, and that he had his world and the multiverse to save. As Doctor Strange walked with Johnny, he could not help but wonder what America Chavez and Loki would be going through at this particular time in their quest to bring back Thor. Location, Thor's Paradise. Thor was not in heaven, but Asgard, the real Asgard, and he could not tell the difference. In essence, Thor was home. He remembered fighting against Kang and wondered what he was suddenly doing in Asgard, but he quickly forgot about that when he saw his mother. Frigga entered his room, and Thor did not even care that he was wearing just his underwear. He rushed to hug her. Frigga was a little startled at his reaction. Thor just held on to her, as he did not want to let her go. Frigga equally continued holding on to him, as she whispered that 
he would be okay. After some moments passed, Thor finally let go as Frigga told him that Odin was waiting for him. Thor could not believe his ears. He asked Frigga how they were alive, how Odin was still alive, and how Asgard was still standing. Frigga just looked at him in bewilderment and asked whether he had a funny dream. Thor was still confused and he asked whether Ragnarok never happened. Frigga laughed and told him that Ragnarok would never happen because they had taken the necessary precautions. Thor got even more perplexed, but then Frigga, his mom, was persistent and told him to come down for breakfast. Thor finally agreed and he started dressing to go down for breakfast with his parents. Even as his head was spinning, he could not believe that both his mom and dad were alive. Thor could not believe that Asgard was still standing. He decided that he would make all his inquiries at the breakfast table. When Thor finished dressing up, he decided that it was time. Location, the hero ship. Peter Parker knew that he should not be feeling as happy as he was, but he couldn't help feel it. He was having the best time of his life, since Kang gave him back his family. As Peter remembered the incident, he felt a pang of sadness in his chest. Peter remembered how hard it was for him to walk out on Aunt May, Uncle Ben, Tony Stark, and his friends. He thought that he had lost them for good. But Kang put him in a different timeline and gave them all back to him. As a temptation for him to remain there, Peter had walked away from the offer of a perfect life, but he knew that he always carried it in his heart. Since then, Peter had been working with Reed Richards, Scott Lang, and Shiri. He was always in awe of the brains that they had. He was always pleasant working with them, and Peter knew that it was almost immoral for him to be having this type of joy in the current situation. During their stay together at the lab, they had invented a lot of things, and, and Peter knew that the members of the Avengers and the Fantastic Four would be amazed at the level of updates they would be getting. Spider-Man was currently in the lab, trying to design a new suit for himself. When he started thinking, about what Reed said. While four of them were working, a discussion ensued. In that discussion, Reed had revealed his origin. Reed had revealed his true purpose of tracking down and destroying Kang the Conqueror. Peter went down memory lane to what Reed Richards had said. All the Kang variants were descendants of Reed Richards' variants. In this case, Reed and the other members of the Fantastic Four were confronted by a Kang variant. Rama Tut. Peter felt chills go down his spine because he had an encounter with the pharaoh looking Kang at the battle. But when he got to know that it was a descendant of Reed, it felt so unreal. Reed explained that Rama Tut wiped out all the Avengers and destroyed his world. Reed was lucky enough to survive as he and the Fantastic Four escaped into outer space in a spaceship. When they came back, they discovered their world was in total shambles. It was then that Reed and the rest of the team vowed to take revenge and destroy all the Kang variants. When Peter had asked Reed why he worked with He Who Remains, he hesitated and then smiled. He told Peter that his case was different. Reed then explained to them that he used resources from his destroyed world to create the ship. They had found a multiversal engine core that was discarded, and Reed used his genius to make it work. He also used that time to study time travel and the different timelines and realities. It was during this time that he and the Fantastic Four discovered that Ramatut was just a variant of the multiple Kang versions. They were bidding their time and they started destroying some Kang variants. They were doing this until he who remained met them. At first, Reed stated that Invisible Woman and the Thing wanted to rip him into pieces, but he and Johnny held them back. After they discussed, they discovered that he who remained was a good person. They were shown how he destroyed his own variants, who had gone berserk because of their thirst for power. He who remained showed them how he created the sacred timeline in order to maintain order. By the time he who remained explained everything to them, they got the whole idea. They could not defeat all the Kang variants without him. Since then, 
they had been working together to rid the world of the Council of Kangs. When they got to know that Kang the Conqueror got out, they readied themselves for war, but he who remains told them to stand down, that he had a plan. Unfortunately, the plan had failed, and they were back to square one. The only good thing that came out of everything was that they now had more recruits and their elite force to defeat Kang the Conqueror, and all the other variants of Kang had been destroyed. At this point, Peter Parker had asked Reed a question that bothered him. Peter asked Reed whether their location meant that Kang could not change and scatter them again throughout the timelines. Reed just chuckled and told Peter that even Kang did not know where they were now. This had put Peter's mind at ease, as he did not want to experience the emotional trauma of meeting his Aunt May and Uncle Ben again. He did not think that he had the type of strength in him to separate from them again. Location, Thor's Paradise. Thor was living in the dream, quite literally. He had aired his questions to his parents, but they stated that it was all nonsense. One thing that shocked him was that this new timeline that he had found himself in, Loki never existed. This really hurted Thor, but it made him think. It really made Thor wonder whether this was how the Asgard of his world would have ended up without Loki. Whether his mom and his dad would have still been alive, and Asgard not destroyed by Ragnarok, if Loki was never born. Thor wondered until he could no more. In the end, he refused to answer the questions. He could not just bring himself to do it. After analyzing everything, Thor decided that he had no choice. He had to stay and rule Asgard with his father. He had to enjoy the moments he did not appreciate with his mom. He knew everything was part of Kang's ploy to keep him, but he decided that it would not hurt to enjoy the moments, at least until the others came for him. The time that the others came for him was at that exact moment. A portal opened into Thor's room, and America Chavez stepped out. Thor did not really know who she was, but he recognized her from the battle. Thor, however, knew the next person that stepped out of the portal. It was Loki. Immediately, Loki stepped through the portal. Thor ran up to him and punched him squarely on the jaw. Loki grunted in pain, but Thor contained the assault. Loki did not do anything to stop him, as he felt that he deserved it. America Chavez just watched in horror as Loki signaled at her to not interfere. After a few moments, Thor got tired of beating up Loki, and he seized entirely and withdrew with tears in his eyes. He questioned Loki and asked him how it was that he was still alive. That's the thing, I'm not him, Loki said, as he grimaced in pain. Loki then went on to explain everything to Thor. He told him about how he was taken in by the TVA, how he and Sylvie had started the whole war, and how he met He Who Remains Again. In essence, Loki told him everything about his journey. Thor just chuckled and said that once a Loki, always a Loki. Then he looked at Loki and said, that it was nice to have his brother back. Loki tried to explain that he was technically not Thor's brother, but he was having none of it. I guess you are here to take me back then, Thor questioned them. And they replied in the affirmative. Thor signed in sorrow, as it was a heart-wrenching choice to make. He had just gotten his parents and his home back. Now he had to leave them again, forever. Can I at least go back and say goodbye? Thor asked America Chavez. But she told him it would not be possible. She explained that her time in the timeline was almost coming to an end because of Kang the Conqueror's design. Once they exited this reality without Thor, it would take ages to track him down again. After she explained this to Thor, he shook his head grimly. Kang had really plotted this well. He had to make his choice, and he had to make it fast. Thor's mind started racing on what to do. In this world, Loki was not present, and it was all peaceful, but if he went back with America Chavez to meet the others, Loki would be constant in his life. Thor weighed both his choices, as each seemed to have its own perks. A world without his parents, but with Loki, or a world with his parents, without Loki. As Thor thought about it, he suddenly remembered that he also had a family, the Avengers. 
he would do anything to protect them, and that made his mind up for him. Well, it would not hurt to have a little Loki in my life again, Thor said, as he chose to go with Chavez to meet the others and finish the war. Location Kang's ship. Kang the Conqueror was at his time throne, and he shouted in fury as he sensed that the last of the Avengers had abandoned the paradise he made for them. They were all like Janet, and he would kill them all. He was furious at their ungratefulness. Even though they had wronged him severely, he had disposed them in timelines that were perfect for them, but they still turned him down. Kang had done so that they could get out of his way. But now, they had decided to still do the opposite. They had chosen to continue fighting him, and he will make that choice of theirs to be their death wish. As Kang contemplated on what to do, he quickly decided that he would not give them a quick death. Kang wanted them to suffer like he did in the Quantum Realm. As Kang thought about that, an evil idea came into his head. Kang decided that he would scatter them across the most desolate of timelines. The most barren and evil timelines. This way, this was to make them suffer, lose hope, and subsequently die. Kang knew that this experience would make them feel what he felt when he was stranded in the quantum realm. Immediately, Kang thought of his plan. He, however, saw the defect of it, and she was America Chavez. Kang quickly decided that he had to get rid of Chavez, because she was the one who aided He Who Remains to get all the Avengers back. Kang figured that once he had her, they would be hopeless in the timelines, he would scatter them to, and they would be unable to unite ever again. Kang laughed evilly as he finally concluded his plans, as finally he would win the war. Kang had been busy creating super soldier clones of himself. This was the army he would use to conquer and destroy the Avengers, and he who remains. Now, all he had to do was wait for them to foolishly come back and attack him. Location, the hero's ship. Once Thor got back, he discovered that he had made the right choice. This was because once he saw the happy faces, he knew that he was home, and he had to protect it at all costs. Thor knew that he had to get his world back, and love too, but he discovered that everybody was just relaxed. Thor was baffled when he questioned Johnny Storm about it. He replied that they were waiting for instructions from He Who Remains. Thor did not like it one bit, but he made use of his time that they had. Thor knew too much about relaxation could do to the body, as he had just recovered his body back. After the first war with Thanos, Thor had gained a beer belly, but that was in the past now. After his arrival, Thor took up the idea of training a regime with Reed, who was very delighted. Reed Richards said that he had a training room installed in their ship, but it was abandoned because of the lack of action. Thor told him not to worry, that everything would soon change. Reed asked him how he planned to achieve the change, but Thor just gave a chuckle. Thor stayed true to his word, and currently, all the Avengers and members of the Fantastic Four were undergoing training. Reed, Scott, Peter and Shiri were the only people that were exempted from the daily training. This was because they also were working at the lab, but Thor still managed to give them training time, as he knew that they had to keep fit as well. Thor paired each of them accordingly to their likeness of abilities for sparring. He paired She-Hulk with the Thing as they drove each other to their limits and discovered new and innovating moves on their journey there. Captain Marvel and Miss Marvel sparred as Carol Danvers still had quite a lot to teach the young Avenger. Thor saw that she was a fast learner and he was sure that she would do just alright even though she was just a kid. Sam Wilson and Bucky sparred together, while Shang-Chi and Moon Knight hit it off together. Thor then sparred with Johnny Storm, an invisible woman. Doctor Strange, on the other hand, continued training America Chavez on how to use her powers. Ever since Thor had arrived, Loki had simply vanished. When he asked, he was told by America Chavez 
that he was with he who remains. The word on the ground was that they were on a highly important mission. Thor was infuriated, nevertheless, and the training did little to calm him down. Deep inside, he wanted action. He wanted to defeat Kang the Conqueror and be done with it. After a few days, his prayers were answered. Reed Richards called for a general emergency meeting at the control room, and they all rushed to it, as this was the first time all of them had a meeting like this. They all wondered what it could possibly be, but it was not until Reed spoke that they knew. The location of Kang the Conqueror has finally been picked up on our radar, Reed said to them, and everyone immediately had mixed feelings. Thor was not one of the people with mixed feelings as he immediately prompted them to go to war against Kang. This brought about divided views from the others, as some supported him while the rest of them were indecisive. Reed stated that it was too rash to take any action yet, as it was fishy that they were able to pinpoint Kang's location now. He stated that it was wise for them to wait for he who remains. This brought about a scoff from Thor, as he stated that he who remains might not even come and see them for the next month, or year, or even decade, as time moved differently in their current location. This brought about a roar of approval from the others. Reed Richards then saw that an impending chaos was brewing, and decided to put it up to a vote. The majority of the heroes voted that they attacked and destroyed Kang now, and Reed was powerless to stop them, even though he knew that it could end up in their doom. Thor had a solid plan. America Chavez would teleport them right into Kang's ship, and they would move swiftly and destroy him. After destroying him, then they could go back to their homes, once they had the time thrown. Everybody agreed that the plan was nice, but a lot of things could go wrong. Reed Richards, who was convinced that everything would go wrong, told Thor to keep some heroes on the ship. In the end, Shiri, Miss Marvel, Invisible Woman, and Peter Parker were assigned to wait behind. This news left Peter distraught, as he wanted to fight Kang. So strong was Peter's resolve to fight, that was when America Chavez opened the portal to Kang's ship. Peter sneaked in with the others. When they crossed over, they discovered that it was a trap. Kang was expecting them. Immediately, they crossed over. Kang seized America Chavez and knocked her unconscious. This provoked the Avengers, and Doctor Strange especially, but all the Kang clones had already surrounded them and pointed their blasters at them. I would not try anything funny if I were you. One blast from these guns, and you will be literally nothing, Kang said. He then nodded at Scott Lang, and one of the clones shot him, and he was completely wiped out. This brought about gasps of sorrow and horror from the heroes. Sorry about that. I wanted to give you guys a little demo, and he always was a little annoying bug, Kang said, void of emotions. He then told them that he offered them paradise, but they refused, and because of that, he would send all of them to hell, and they would not have Chavez to save them this time. After Kang said that, he winked, and all of them found themselves in a different location. Johnny Storm, Spider-Man, and Moon Knight found themselves in a timeline full of destruction. What was strange about the world was that there was no living beings in sight, and they could literally feel radiation from the ground. Doctor Strange was with Shang-Chi and She-Hulk, and they found themselves trapped in a sort of normal world, but they were immediately escorted by strange-looking beings. Carol Danvers, Bucky, and Captain America were trapped in a world currently undergoing a world war. They were dropped during a crossfire and they immediately had to take cover. Reed Richards and The Thing were not sent to any other timeline. They were kept as prisoners as Kang wanted to torture them personally. They had killed too many of his variants to go free. Kang then laughed evilly as his plan had come to fruition. The heroes had been separated and now they would all suffer and beg for their death. The fact that he had also ended the life of Scott Lang filled him with a dark joy. One thing however bothered Kang though, he had not gotten all the heroes, but he quickly trashed the idea as he believed that the rest were worthless. He had to set his eyes on he who remains now. Location: 
Kang's ship. Kang the Conqueror sat in his throne room as he felt invincible. The one thing on his mind, however, was he who remains. He knew that Reed and the others would have at least have a link of where he was. Kang also knew that there were others left at their base, but he could still not locate their ship. It was as if their location was outside of time. The possibility of that gave Kang chills, as he remembered the Quantum Realm, the only place that could hold him. Bring me Reed Richards, Kang ordered, and his clones quickly obeyed him. Reed was brought before him and made to kneel. Kang told him, that he had two questions for him. Reed replied that he would never answer them, even at the risk of his own life. Reed made Kang laugh. He told Reed that he had all the time in the world to torture him, and that eventually he would break. Reed knew that this was the truth, and he tried to maintain his calm composure. Kang saw through his disguise. He saw that Reed was afraid, and he smiled. Kang was an expert in things like this. He was, after all, the Conqueror. And he knew how to break men like Reed, and he was going for the easiest way. Reed, like other heroes like Scott Lang, could not stand their loved ones being hurt, and Kang planned to capitalize on this. Kang clapped his hands, and his clones brought him America Chavez, who was gagged, and who was in chains. They unceremoniously dumped her on the floor and Kang stated the rules of his game calmly and menacing to Reed. Kang told him that for any question that he asks Reed that he did not answer, Chavez would lose a limb. You would not dare. She's just a child, Reed screamed at Kang. That's the point, exactly, Kang said with a sneer. Currently, all the heroes had power restricting callers on them, and that dismissed the fear of Chavez teleporting to another universe. Now, for the first question, where are the others? Kang asked Reed. Reed hesitated, and Kang immediately gave the order for Chavez's arm to be cut off. The clones moved swiftly, but Reed's voice stopped them. He pleaded for them to stop, as he was ready to talk. Chavez would have been a short arm. The blade had already drawn blood from her skin. Reed knew that he could not win this battle. He had only hoped that the others had been wise to evacuate when they did not come back. Reed told Kang the location, and he was impressed. Reed's explanation now made the whole situation of him not being able to find them make sense. Kang immediately sent out soldiers to capture the remaining heroes and destroy the ship. Now for my last question. Where is he who remains? Kang asked. He signaled the clones controlling Chavez to go for her head this time. One of the clones pulled her by her hair, thereby exposing her neck while the other lifted up his blade, ready to decapitate her. Reed was in sheer horror. He pleaded with Kang that he did not seriously know that he who remains did not reveal his location to him. Kang was having none of it. He called Reed a liar. He asked Reed if the location of he who remains, who was one of the variants of the person who destroyed his world, was enough to sacrifice for the life of Chavez. Reed stated that it was not while pleading. Kang just signed in dismay and ordered his clones to swing down the blade through his mind, as this was just one of his newest upgrades. He added to his soldiers. He could control them through his mind, just like his time chair. Reed's scream of horror was held throughout Kang's ship, as he knew what was going to happen. Kang was going to murder Chavez, and it was not even his fault. Reed closed his eyes as he could not possibly watch, because the fear and horror in Chavez's eyes was just too much for him. The blade came down with a sickening sound, and Reed opened his eyes fearful as he knew that he was not prepared for the sight that was before him. But he was wrong. The clone had just chopped off Chavez's hair, and Reed's heart along with it as Mr. Fantastic was livid with terror and relief. Your life is still safe for now, Kang told Chavez as he ordered his clones to take them back inside their cells. 
Everything was going to plan, and Kang could not be more happy. I wonder how the other heroes are faring now, Kang said to himself, in murderous glee. I even wonder how many of them are still alive. Location, Earth 1789. After much investigation that left them bared and bruised, Johnny Storm, Spider-Man and Moon Knight got to find out where they really were. They were in a world where Ultron had succeeded. In this world, Ultron had killed every living thing, and they seemed to be the only people alive. Once they got this discovery, they realized Kang's plan. Kang wanted them to suffer and be tortured before they got killed. The idea that a human being might take pleasure in toying with another human being before he killed him was sickening, but then again, the Romans did the same thing, Thor concluded. So, what are we going to do? Just stay here until he finds us, Spider-Man asked? Immediately he asked the question. A red light scanned their location, and a siren suddenly went off. Apparently, drones were scanning this particular city for signs of life at the command of Ultron, and one of those drones just caught them. The drone started wailing and called for backup. In a heartbeat, Thor threw a Stormbreaker, and it destroyed the drone, but it was already too late. Swarms of robots flooded their location, and they knew that they had to stand and fight. Moon Knight brought out his moon-shaped blade. As he transformed, it was a full moon, and he was at full power. Spider-Man was scared as he knew that this could very well be his last fight. He then suited up and brought out his metallic spider legs. This was one of the many upgrades that Shiri and Reed had helped him with on his brand new suit. Thor just roared and charged head on into battle. As he charged Stormbreaker up with lightning, he blasted about one third of the army to smithereens with his first strike and he still wailed through the debris to smash more robots. Johnny Storm just stood rooted at a spot as he baited some robots to come. They all pounced at him, and a moment later, they were all in flames as Johnny had transformed to the Human Torch. Spider-Man used his metal legs to rip robots apart, as he also shot electrical charges from his wrists that short-circuited the robots. This was another upgrade to his Spider-Man suit, the ability to shoot electrical charges. Spider-Man and Moon Knight fought side by side, and they were on a rampage. They cut through the robots like butter. They fought like that for a long time, until they started to wear out. This was because the robots just kept on coming. The heroes knew that, eventually, they would wear out and the robots would conquer them. This made them start thinking of retreating. Thor gave a final blast of lightning, and it cleared all the robots at their front, and brought them little to escape. Thor knew that he and Johnny could fly away, but he did not know how Moon Knight and Spider-Man would keep up. As they made for the roof to escape, the robots started blasting at them, and one of the blasts cut through Moon Knight's leg. This incapacitated him as he could no longer run. Moon Knight looked at them, and they all knew what he wanted to do. He wanted to sacrifice his life and hold the robots off while they escaped. The thing was that there was no point in arguing with him because his mind was made up. Moon Knight nodded at them and turned to face the robots with a fierce gleam in his eyes. Moon Knight's eyes fell on a puddle of water, and he saw his reflection. This suddenly changed to the reflection of Stephen Grant, and they both nodded to themselves as Moon Knight charged in battle, in full berserk mode. Thor held Spider-Man by his arm, and he took off with Stormbreaker once they reached the roof, while Johnny Storm used his flame powers to fly off. All of them had tears in their eyes as they flew in the agonized shriek of Moon Knight, that sounded through the night did not make things better. Location, Earth 2095. Carol Danvers, Bucky, and Captain America were trapped in a world that was currently at a war. In their world, Red Skull had won the war, and he was in charge. This was very well shocking to all of them, as this meant that Captain America was killed by Red Skull. Once they were disposed in this world by Kang, they had to fight for their lives, as they were in the middle of a crossfire. Hydra had extremely advanced firepower, 
In this reality, they had been successful in harnessing the power of one of the Infinity Stones. After he had done this, he had gone to infuse its power with Hydra, and Red Skull was one of the most powerful people in the universe. The results of this was very successful, but devastating on the Americans and Captain America, as he got killed by Red Skull. Captain America's death then ensured that the Valkyrie bombings of America was a success. Currently in this world, America no longer existed, but a few opposition groups still existed. Carol Danvers had been able to get this information as she sneaked around to get it. Once they got to know the situation of their current world, they decided that they had to save it. Falcon felt that it was a duty that was primarily assigned to him, as he needed to fulfill Steve Rogers, who was his mentor. Bucky also felt the need to rid the world of Red Skull, as it would give him the satisfaction of all the years of his life that he had lost because of the villains, even though it was a different version of them. After they had agreed on what to do, they started strategizing. Kang had sent us to this hellhole to die, but we will make it a paradise before we leave, Carol said, with conviction, and the others agreed with her. Location? Earth 11652. Doctor Strange had been in very strange places before, but this one took the crown. Immediately, they had been displaced to a different world. Strange knew that there was something wrong. Doctor Strange was with Shang-Chi and She-Hulk were together, but something did not feel right. Immediately, they landed. They were confronted by strange human beings. What made them strange was their powers and it was only later that the heroes got to know that they were called the X-Men. As they engaged themselves in combat, Strange knew that their best option was to flee, as they were outmaned and overpowered. This was because of mutants like Wolverine, Storm, Cyclops, amongst many others. It was only then when Doctor Strange saw Professor Charles Xavier that he unleashed the winds of Wadaboom, and it blasted everyone back. Wait, Doctor Strange shouted, as the X-Men were gearing up to come back to battle. I know you, Strange added as he pointed at Charles Xavier. Strange had seen him in his early travels with America Chavez, and he knew he had to be a good man. Strange told Charles that he knew that he was a good man, and that there was also good people. Charles Xavier looked at him in the eye, and Strange knew that he was just chasing wild hopes as because he met a good version of Charles in one timeline. Did not mean that this particular one was not evil. However, there was just something about the situation that made Strange take his decision. Just because someone stumbles and loses their way does not mean they are lost forever. Strange told Charles, and he ordered the X-Men to lower their guard. He then welcomed the heroes to their hideout. However, cautiously, as he wanted to hear their stories before considering what to do to them. Even though this decision was not a popular one by the X-Men. Location? Kang's ship. Kang roared in outrage as his mission had failed. The clones had gone to the ship, but the rest of the heroes were nowhere to be found. Reed had already been questioned, but even he could not possibly know their whereabouts. Kang was so angry as he did not know where Shiri, Miss Marvel, an invisible woman, had suddenly vanished to. The ship had been ransacked, but it proved to be futile. Kang knew that they did not really pose any threats, but if they reunited with He Who Remains, then they could cause major damage. Kang was also a good strategist, to know that if a conqueror allowed the opposition, no matter how small they were to thrive, then they would cause maximum damage to the nearest future. Kang then proceeded to send his clones to search the nearby timelines in space, where the ship was located. He would not let any of them get away. Location? Reed's hideout. Shiri knew that they would be dead without the help of Reed Richards, Scott, Peter, and her invention. While in the laboratory, they had created the ultimate stealth suit. It had no heat readings, due to Scott's contribution of Pym Particles. The suit could also turn the wearer invisible. Once the others had left, Shiri had just finished up the suit by making it soundless, just like her Black Panther suit. Reed had developed a machine that could clone anything, and that was how she was able to get more than enough amounts of vibranium. Once the suit was ready, 
Shiri cloned the suit into multiple pieces using Reed's machine, and this was what they used to escape Kang's clones. They had also shrunken down, and they were riding on one of the clones back, undetected, as it flew back to Kang's location. When they had gotten to his location, they immediately set out to rescue the others. Kamala rescued Chavez, as the two bonded very well during their stay at the ship. Invisible Woman rescued Reed, who was very surprised to see her, while Shiri rescued the Thing. They were all given the suits, and within moments, they were out of Kang's location. Before Kang knew about it, they were far gone, and he bellowed in outrage and wonder. Reed had another secret location that was hidden from Kang's sight, and he led them there. Once they got there, Reed started tracking the heroes as he had placed a tracking device in most of their upgraded suits. Once he found them all, they started sending Chavez to rescue them, even as they prayed that they were still alive. Location, Earth 1789. Thor, Johnny Storm, and Spider-Man arrived at the location of Ultron. Spider-Man had used one of the fallen sentries to track him down. They were about to attack him when a portal suddenly opened. When Thanos emerged out of the portal, with the five Infinity Stones, they were in awe. Their awe increased when Ultron suddenly sliced Thanos into two bits, effortlessly. When he started levitating the Infinity Stones towards himself, Spider-Man snapped out of his shock and snatched them away with his webs. Ultron immediately fired a laser at him, but he dodged it mid-air. As Ultron continued firing lasers at Peter, Thor immediately threw Stormbreaker at the robot, and it brought Peter some time to catch his breath. The battle line was drawn and Ultron was surprised that there were still people who were really alive in his world. He immediately found his purpose of destroying all life on Earth renewed. Ultron quickly went into battle with them, even as he alerted his sentries to come to his aid. Johnny Storm spent his time blasting away Ultron's sentries from coming to his aid while Thor and Peter battled Ultron himself. Peter suddenly discovered that Ultron's suit was made of the same material as Shiri's suit, which was vibranium. Peter suddenly deduced that it would not be hard to defeat Ultron. He then communicated to Thor on what to do, and the God of Thunder's face suddenly turned grim. Thor nodded, and Peter handed over the Infinity Stones to him as he went to distract Ultron. Thor smashed the stones into Stormbreaker, and he absorbed all the powers of the stones through it. Thor was not sure that he would have been able to withstand the power of the stones by himself. That was why he used Stormbreaker. Immediately he was done, and he had unlimited power. And at the same time, Ultron blasted Peter aside. Thor roared with rage and smashed Stormbreaker on the ground and all of Ultron's sentries, including himself, were blasted apart. Thor then walked up to the head of Ultron, even as it was trying to reform himself, and he smashed it with Stormbreaker, and he retrieved the Mind Stone. After that, Thor, Human Torch, and Spider-Man were in a happy mood, but they did not know how to feel, as there was nobody to save this world. Immediately, a portal opened in front of them. Even though they were beaten, in sorrow, Tired and bruised, they all smiled because they were going home. Location, Earth 2095. Carol, Falcon, and Bucky had kept to their word. They were currently at the top of a Hydra building. Falcon had flown Bucky there, but Carol handled herself. Once they landed, they went over their plans again to avoid mistakes. Their mission was simple, Red Skull. They just needed to defeat him, and everyone in Hydra would scatter. Bucky was not sure that their plan would work, because he knew Hydra. Their memento was, if you cut one head, then many more others would take its place. It was only Bucky that knew this, and that was why he had a different plan of his own. Once they infiltrated the building, they quickly went to work. Bucky and Falcon quickly incapacitated two soldiers, and collected their guns as it was more advanced. They cleared a pathway of destruction to Red Skull's lair. Once they reached, Red Skull had already been alerted of one of them, but he was surprised to see Captain America's shield in Falcon's hands. Where did you get that shield? Red Skull asked. In surprise, 
but Falcon threw the shield at him in response. Red Skull immediately dodged the shield and grinned at Falcon. Pitful, he said. Falcon just smiled at him, because his target was not Red Skull, but the chandelier above him. Falcon's shield cut through the support of the chandelier, and it fell and impaled a very shocked Red Skull to the ground. Falcon quickly caught his shield back. All right, mission accomplished. It's time to move out, Captain Marvel said, as she was trying to hold back Hydra agents trying to flood in on them, and they were getting too overwhelmed. Falcon brought out his wings and stretched his hands for Bucky to grab so that they could fly out of the building, but the Winter Soldier just went to Red Skull's corpse and unleashed three headshots in quick succession. That's enough, Bucky. He's dead, Falcon said, as he urged Bucky to take his hand so that they could evacuate. But they are not, Bucky said, as he signaled at the Hydra agents. Falcon and Carol suddenly understood what he meant. In a subsequent split second, they also realized what he intended to do, and they already started protesting, but Bucky remained adamant. Go on without me. I will cripple Hydra so well that they will never be able to terrorize this world anymore, Bucky said. Falcon and Carol looked at Bucky with tears in his eyes and painfully departed as they knew that he could not be stopped. When they left, Bucky acted quickly as the Hydra agents were already onto him. They were just stunned by the corpse of Red Skull, but soon they would gather their wits and kill him. Bucky started shooting rapidly at the Tesseract that was at the center of Red Skull's lair. Bucky knew that the Infinity Stone was powering the entire building, and his goal was to overload it. Bucky's plan was a success, as the core expanded and sucked everything in and everyone into it. Within minutes, the entire Hydra building, its agents, and Bucky Barnes were no more. Carol and Falcon wept more when they heard the blast. At that moment, a portal appeared in front of them. They were going home. Location, Earth 11652. Doctor Strange, Shang-Chi, and She-Hulk had no choice but to follow the X-Men to battle Doctor Doom, who was apparently their nemesis and the cause of destruction and havoc of this world. After a fierce battle with all of his soldiers, they discovered that Doctor Doom was nowhere to be found. It was as if he vanished. Charles Xavier was very wary about this, but suddenly a portal appeared in front of them, and they were all startled. Strange looked on, and he recognized the portal's energy. It was America. This immediately gave him joy as it meant that she was safe. But then a dark thought came into Strange, that it might also mean that Kang was forcing her to lure them. Strange quickly dismissed the thought, as Kang could round all of them up again with a snap of his fingers because he controlled the timelines now. Shang-Chi explained to the X-Men that it was time for them to depart, and the news was met with mixed emotions as during the hero's stay, the mutants had actually developed a liking towards them. They said their goodbyes and started entering the portal, but the strangest thing happened to She-Hulk, who was the last person to enter the portal. As she entered, she felt a person brush past her in the portal. It was a strange thing, because she did not see anybody, and the only reason it was assumed that it was somebody was because how she felt about it. She-Hulk sincerely hoped that they had not unwittingly let evil into the portal. Things had been going pretty well for the heroes since they were united again. Once they came back, they mourned Scott, Bucky, and Moon Knight. Peter stated that he missed Moon Knight, even though he gave him the creeps. After that, they had gone on to take care of their wounds, and there were quite a lot of them. Their various battles had left most of them injured. Reed had an infirmary on their new hideout ship. It was not as sophisticated as the one on their former ship, but they had to make do with it. Their backup ship was also limited, and it made them share bunks and rooms. They could not complain either, as it was much better than nothing. Once all the heroes had gathered, they decided that they had to recover first before they had a meeting. Thor thought about rallying them to attack Kang again, but he hastily trashed the idea out of his mind. This was because they were in no condition to fight any more battles for now. 
Another reason was that it was Thor's idea that they got them in this condition. Thor felt extreme guilt within him. He was beating himself up for charging the heroes into battle, with him urging them to war with Kang. Scott, Moon Knight, and Bucky would be still alive. Shiri had noted the change of expression and demeanor in Thor, and she counseled him. Shiri told him that she believed she spoke for the entire heroes when she said that they did not blame him for any of this. One person we all blame, though, is Kang, Shiri said with malice in her voice, as she had gotten quite close to Scott and the other heroes that were killed. Scott's closeness to her came as a result of them working in the laboratory together with Reed Richards and Peter Parker. Every other hero affirmed this, and Thor felt a little better. After that, they had gone their separate ways, but most of them went to tend to their wounds. While going, none of them saw the strange incident that happened in their ship. Right after they had left and closed the doors to the conference room, the door opened by itself again and closed after a few seconds. It was almost as if an invisible person had done it. Location, Doctor Strange and Shang-Chi's compartment. Doctor Strange had this weird feeling lately. Strange felt like there was an unseen being on their ship. He had taken it up with the others privately, and they also shared their weird experiences of feeling an unease person brush past them at times. Strange had used his third eye, and he had gotten a faint glimpse of someone one particular day, but it lasted just a couple of moments. Strange knew that he still had more practice to do in regards to the usage of his third eye, but the fact that someone could escape it meant that the person was not a novice. While Strange was in his chambers meditating, he heard a knock on the door, and he went to open it because his roommate, Shang-Chi, was practicing in the training room. Strange was surprised to see that it was She-Hulk, as they were not really friends, and it meant that whatever she wanted to discuss with him was serious. Strange let her in, and she spilled everything. She-Hulk confined her experience at the Earth that Kang had sent them to. She stated that she felt someone rush past her in the portal. She said that at first, she was cautious, but her mind just dismissed the event as a fragment of her imagination, and she forgot about it. It was not until recently, when she started hearing rumors of the ship being hunted, that she remembered the strange event. Strange felt chills go down his spine as he heard the news from She-Hulk. There was only one explanation to everything that was going through his mind, but he did not want to believe it. It can't be, Strange whispered, and She-Hulk immediately caught on to him. You think it's him? She-Hulk asked. Strange with obvious fear in her voice. Strange nodded as that there was only one explanation he could think of. She-Hulk was livid with fear and guilt, as she felt that it was all her fault. But Strange quickly stopped her. He told her that if it was really the person they thought he was, then there would be nothing they could do to stop him. Just one name was on their minds, and it was Doctor Doom. During their stay at Earth 11652, they had heard a lot of scary and downright horrifying stories about Doctor Doom. He was the villain that single-handedly brought chaos and destruction into their world. His powers were too much to mention. Charles Xavier said that he had the ability to steal people's powers, and over time, he had acquired a lot. He was also a sorcerer and one of the most intelligent, if not the most intelligent man of his reality. All these descriptions of him and the tales of his evil deeds had given Strange and the others the conviction that they would never leave the Earth alive, but they cast the notion aside and convinced the X-Men to go to war. They had drafted a foul proof strategy and they struck Doctor Doom's tower. All of his Doom bots were destroyed, but when they had gone to his throne room, he was nowhere to be found, and this caught them off guard. It was now that everything made sense to Doctor Strange. Doctor Doom had turned invisible, and none of them could spot him. Maybe he wanted to escape and fight another day, or wait for more reinforcements. 
Strange did not know. However, what Doctor Strange knew was that once Chavez had opened the portal for them to come home, Doctor Doom had seized the opportunity to escape the wrath of the X-Men and maybe possibly punish them for their actions against him. Strange was still in fear, but his only question was what game Doctor Doom was playing and why he had not striked up until now. They had left themselves open severely, but why had he not taken the opportunity? She-Hulk had no answers to the question, and Strange decided that he had to inform the others as they deserved the right to know. With that, Doctor Strange and She-Hulk decided to move to Reed's chambers to call for an emergency meeting. Doctor Doom heard everything that Doctor Strange and She-Hulk said, and it amused him. He was surprised that it had taken them this long to figure everything out. Strange had asked a very important question though. Doctor Doom said, as he asked himself why he had not yet attacked them. Doctor Doom had perfect opportunities to kill all of them, but he had stopped himself. He could have easily stolen their powers, but he had most of them already. Doctor Doom was a little surprised when he passed through the portal and saw Reed and other members of the Fantastic Four and the Avengers. He was completely dumbfounded, but that was a nice thing, as he was not supposed to attract attention seeing that he was invisible. On his Earth, Doctor Doom had killed and destroyed all members of the Avengers and the Fantastic Four. Even the current power of invisibility he was using was gotten from the late Invisible Woman, Sue Storm, of his world. The only heroes that remained were the X-Men and Doctor Doom. And Doctor Doom felt reluctant to kill them because they were his only source of entertainment. Once Doctor Doom started moving around, he got quite an eye opening from all the knowledge he received. Doctor Doom got to learn that there were other timelines and parallel realities. All his life, Doctor Doom had only based his focus on conquering Earth and then maybe other planets, but now he got to know that there were multiple Earths. This was still quite shocking for Doctor Doom, and the first thought of action that came to his mind was to steal the power of America Chavez. This was because from the knowledge he had gained from snooping around, he got to know that she could travel through multiple timelines as she pleased. Doctor Doom was about to steal her powers until he learnt about Kang the Conqueror. The way that the hero spoke about him with fear drew his attention to the name. He later got to know that Kang was the one who controlled the entire timelines. Once Doctor Doom knew this, he cancelled his plans for stealing America Chavez's powers. Why be a mere traveler when I can be a conqueror? Doctor Doom asked himself. His plan was set. He would remain with the heroes until they go to war with Kang. And then, when no one would expect it, he would steal his powers and defeat them all. But now, it seemed like plans would change because of Strange and She-Hulk's discovery of him. If they informed everyone of his presence, then it might pose a very big problem to his plan. Doctor Doom decided he could not have that. I guess I will just have to destroy everyone and steal the girl's powers after all, Doctor Doom said with a mock remorse, as he was about to carry out his plans to destroy both Strange and She-Hulk before they left to alert Reed. Miss Marvel entered into Strange's compartment, and the sheer shock paused him. Miss Marvel was winded, and she took a few seconds to catch her breath, while Strange and She-Hulk bombarded her with questions of what happened. He is here, Miss Marvel said, in between gasps. Who is here? She-Hulk asked, with surprise and worry written on both her and Strange's face. Doctor Doom's face was however written with curiosity, even though none of them could see it. He who remains is finally here, Miss Marvel said. An emergency meeting was held immediately, and Doctor Doom was in attendance outside the knowledge of everyone. He who remains addressed the heroes and apologized for taking so much time. He stated that he was trying to get reinforcements to combat Kang. The Thing asked him if he succeeded in getting the enforcements, but he shook his head grimly. His sad expression was shared with Loki and Mobius, who had joined him in his journey. However, we are going to war without the reinforcements, he who remained declared. 
and everyone was caught off guard. Do you mean now? Like right now, Peter asked. And he who remains replied in the affirmative. He told them that the time was right. It was at this point that Falcon lashed out at him in tears. He told him that it was his fault that they lost Bucky, Moon Knight, and Scott Lang. Falcon told He Who Remains that his absence and lack of communication has led to their defeat and loss of lives. I did not ask any of you to go to war with Kang, He Who Remains said calmly, and this raised an uproar from the heroes. Doctor Doom was watching them with amusement. He Who Remains signaled that they quiet down as he was not done saying what he wanted to say. As I was saying, I did not ask any of you to go to war against Kang, alone. And that was why you failed. But I am here now. He Who Remains said calmly as the heroes quieted down. All the lives that have been lost in this war, I will recover them. All once Kang is defeated, I assure you that, he who remains said, and the heroes understood. They just needed to defeat Kang, and everything would go back to normal. He who remains would make sure of that. How can we trust you though, Carol Danvers asked. And this was met with muffers of agreement from the crowd. He who remains stated that they could trust him because all they wanted was the same thing. And that was, and that was, orderliness in this timeline and the eradication of Kang. With that, all of them were convinced and they all started preparing for war. The only person that was excited to go to battle was Doctor Doom because he would finally be able to meet Kang the Conqueror himself. Location, He Who Remains, Planet. The heroes prepared themselves and He Who Remains told them the plan. They were going to battle on neutral grounds. His plan was to use himself as bait. If he did that, Kang would not pass up the opportunity to end him once and for all. After he who remains had given them their portions and their role, he stated that it was time. He then opened a portal and that led them to the planet for war. The planet was desolate and he explained that this was his world after his variants had destroyed it. So what happens now, Falcon asked. He who remains told him that they had to wait for Kang, as he had already sent out a signal. It turned out that they did not have to wait long, as Kang soon materialized on his time throne, with hordes of his clones behind him. Kang knew that he had all of them now. He who remains was stupid to enter into his reach of the timeline, and now he would destroy all of them. But as Kang tried to wipe them all out, with his time manipulation, he discovered that he could not. This brought about a chuckle from He Who Remains. He told the Conqueror that his planet was neutral ground, and that his time manipulation would not work here. This only phased Kang a little as he grinded his teeth. It does not matter. This planet would be all of your brutal grounds, Kang roared. As he jumped down from his throne, as he suited up in his armor, Kang then commanded his clones to attack. The heroes all looked up at he who remains, as he stated that he had a plan to even the odds. He told them to hold on for the clones, to come within range. The heroes were still terrified because they knew what the blasters of the clones' guns could do to them, as the death of Scott Lang was still fresh in their heads. Once they were a few feet away, he who remains snapped his fingers, and Eliath materialized. Eliath immediately started destroying the clones, and Kang's face was that of horror and a brief moment of fear, but he quickly smirked. You think you are the only one who has been busy? Kang asked. He who remains, as he laughed darkly, he clapped his hands and Sylvie appeared at his side from his ship. Loki's heart skipped a beat when he saw her, and he was about to run towards his long lost love, who betrayed him, but Thor held him back. Sylvie, on the other hand, displayed no emotion when she saw Loki. Kang then whispered something to her and she nodded. Then, she brought out a cube and used her enchantments to unlock it. What came out from the cube was downright horrifying. It was a more darker and monstrous version of Eliath. The two monsters collided and the planet threatened to rip apart. Kang threw a fake salute to He Who Remains as he ascended his time throne and levitated towards his ship. 
so that he and Sylvie, with his remaining soldiers, could escape, while the others perished in this world. Doctor Strange quickly caught on to their plan and shook his head angrily. The battle between Eliath and the other evil version of it had already started wreaking havoc on the heroes, as some of them were being thrown away by the sheer force and rocks were plummeting them. Doctor Strange then used his sling ring to open a portal to get everyone to safety, but he was not sufficient for everybody as within moments, the whole planet would be destroyed. Kang's ship had already flown away to a safe distance. Doctor Strange now called on Chavez and told her that it was time to use her training. Chavez stated that she was not sure she could do it. Before the whole Kang saga, Strange had been teaching Chavez how to teleport between short distances, and she had been getting it gradually and slowly, but this was something else. Strange wanted her to teleport everyone to Kang's ship. America Chavez knew that she had one shot, and she put everything into it. She immediately punched the ground and a portal opened on the planet floor and all the heroes fell into it. They immediately landed inside Kang's ship and they started fighting his clones. It was a very tough war as the clones had advanced weapons, but Reed had created a high frequency sonic blaster that short circuited all their blasts. This made the battle somewhat equal. The heroes went into full battle mode and they threw everything that they had. He Who Remains was trying to reach Kang but dozens of clones surrounded him. This was Kang's command to them, and when Loki came closer to Kang, he was stopped by Sylvie. They started fighting, but Loki was going all defensive, as he did not want to hurt her. Loki told Sylvie to snap out of it, that this wasn't her, it was a new, but her face remained neutral. Kang laughed and told him that it was pointless, that Sylvie was a true Loki, and he was not. He stated that he had promised her dominion over the timelines by his side, as his queen. This news was heart-wrenching for Loki, and Sylvie capitalized on this. She immediately performed a roundhouse kick on Loki's chest, and it skidded a large amount of distance from Kang, knocked out of the air. Kang then decided to end the war, and he was about to put his hand on his multiversal engine core to release a maximum devastating blast to kill everyone except him and Sylvie, who was now at his side. Peter saw this and knew what he was about to do, because he had done the same thing back on Earth. Peter then shot a web at his hands, and restrained him from bringing it down. Kang was quickly annoyed and he cut the web, but Parker shot another one. This was how he kept going for moments, until Kang was truly pissed. He then levitated Peter and wanted to start breaking his bones, one by one. But Captain America's shield suddenly hit him on the head, and he lost focus, which caused Peter to drop to the floor. Once Kang's vision cleared, he discovered that the heroes had defeated all of his clones. Even though they were bloodied, beaten, and heavily bruised, Kang then felt his most dreaded emotion, fear. Immediately he wanted to blast all of them, but he felt hands on his neck, and then everything went dark, as someone snapped his neck. That person materialized, and it was Doctor Doom, and he threw Kang's body on the ground. Doctor Doom immediately extended his hand out, and blasted Lovi- and blasted Sylvie away, and took his place on the Time Throne. He had been around since the war, but he had just been looking for the perfect opportunity to present himself and take action. There was a lot of gasps from the heroes, especially Doctor Strange and She-Hulk. Doctor Doom explained who he was and his story. He told them that he had stolen Kang's power, and now he was invincible. He stated that he felt all the powers of the timelines running through him as he placed his hand on the multiversal engine core. Doctor Doom said that he was the new conqueror, and that he would rule the entire timelines as it's deemed fit. He who remains in the heroes decided that they could not let that happen, and they immediately rushed to Doctor Doom to destroy him. Doctor Doom just paused time, but the one only person that seemed unfazed by this was He Who Remains. The other heroes could only watch as two of them fought. Doctor Doom had the upper hand as he quite as he had quite an arsenal of powers. Doom blasted He Who Remains with spells 
and force fields, but to no effect. Because of the technological advanced shield the first Kang variant had, Doom snarled in frustration as he who remains was still closing in on him fast. Even after his efforts, Dr. Doom then decided to completely eradicate him. He placed his hand on the multiverse engine core and blasted He Who Remains. Sylvie then jumped in the way as Dr. Doom had forgotten about her. The blast completely obliterated her and still shattered He Who Remains' shield completely as it blasted him several feet back. If it was not for Sylvie's sacrifice, he would have been completely eradicated. A tear dropped from Loki, even as he still stood there because of the death of Sylvie. Doom then levitated He Who Remains as he laughed. He asked how one puny Kang variant could possibly defeat him. Even as he started twisting his insides, He Who Remains grunted in pain as he spoke to Doctor Doom. That's where you got it wrong. We are two, He Who Remains said as he smiled, and Doctor Doom's tone and expression was that of surprise. That was the last expression he had as a whole, was blasted straight through his head. Iron Lad suddenly emerged from his hideout. Sorry I'm late, he said, and he who remains smiled. He who remains knew that Kang did not either know about the existence of Iron Lad, or he had forgotten about him. This was why he made it his mission to try and convince the kid to join him and the Avengers. Iron Lad was a child variant of Kang. At first, Iron Lad had turned down the offer, but he had come around. He Who Remains explained to the heroes, who were now free from the time freeze, that Iron Lad was the purpose of his mission this entire time. After that, He Who Remains then ascended the time throne, and he thanked the heroes for their participation in the Secret Wars. He then told them that he would keep to his promise, and return everything and everyone to how they once were. There is somehow a catch. None of you would remember the events of this war, he who remains stated. This brought about discussion from the heroes, who had mixed feelings about the memory aspect, but in the end, they agreed. He who remains then thanked them and nodded his head. Everything went dark. Location, Earth 616. Everything was back to normal. Scott Lang, Moon Knight, and Bucky Barnes were back. The world was as if nothing had ever happened. The only person that remembered everything was America Chavez. This was because she was the only version of herself in every timeline. But it had even taken her time to remember everything. And when she did, she immediately told Doctor Strange, who was quite surprised. When she asked Strange if they should tell the others, he decided against it. What they don't know will not haunt them, he said. Location, TVA facility. Meanwhile, at the TVA, a rogue Sylvie variant is brought before the court, and sitting as the judge is Loki. That is going to be it for if I had written Avengers Secret Wars. Now, what did you think of this version of events? I tried to really tie in a lot more of the characters within this timeline to really showcase, you know, Moon Knight, Spider-Man, and a lot of other characters, although I didn't fully add in the symbiote Spider-Man, I think it was a little bit teased at the beginning of this video, but I didn't really want to go in depth with all that, although I could have, I really wanted to showcase the other heroes in this storyline and really give a new version of events and really showcase, you know, Doctor Doom at the very end. I think that was really cool where he ended up killing Kang the Conqueror. But that being said, that's going to be it for this video. If you guys haven't already checked out, if I had written the MCU's Avengers the Kang Dynasty, I would highly recommend that you take a look at that because that one um, did come out about a month ago, I would say, almost a month ago. But I do want to update everybody. I got Spider-Man 8 through 10 coming out soon, and I also have The Amazing Spider-Man 4, if I had written. That will be coming out shortly. If you guys do enjoy these videos, do make sure to subscribe, like, share, and turn those notifications on, so you and your friends are all up to date 
with the latest content. I also do want to say starting at just $1 a month, do make sure to check out the Patreon. There's so many different perks. You can see videos early. I would highly recommend it if you're somebody who would like to see extra content on the Miss the Part channel. You can also request videos there. We do a lot of voting polls. There's so much stuff going on. But thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed my version of events. And that being said, I might do another version in the future, depending on how long it, it takes for us to, you know, get Secret Wars, because I heard that it was delayed. But I do want to say that for now, I have, if I had written the Kang Dynasty and Secret Wars finally out, and I do feel like I could have done it a little bit differently, but I really wanted to showcase the other heroes. But thank you so much for tuning in, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace out.